Praise the Lord and welcome to the Living Witness Broadcast. This is Pastor Derek Thomas and I thank you for taking time out on this Lord's Day to join us. We're starting a new series on faith and the title of our sermon is the title of our series, Now Faith. Truly the Lord has a word for us on today and he especially has a word for us in this season through this message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you this day for your word and we worship you and magnify your name for the opportunity to hear from heaven, O God. Father God, we just bless you and ask you to speak boldly, Lord God, through the vessel you've chosen for this moment. Saturate him in your anointing, O God, and truly use him for your glory. Father God, by faith, we thank you and praise you for teaching us about faith and truly making us doers of your word and not hearers only. We bind the hand of the enemy now and every hindering spirit that would seek to keep your word from going forth. And we thank you and praise you, Lord God, for your anointing and for your power and for your might, Lord God, that souls will be saved and lives will be changed as your word goes forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text today is found in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, a very familiar passage, verses 1 through 3, and reads as follows. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. As we speak to the subject, now faith. Without question, faith is one of those topics that gets preached and taught many, many times over in the course of a year. Yet oftentimes it's misunderstood and misconstrued in many different ways. What God desires us to understand about faith is that faith is more than a feeling. Like love, faith is a choice. And we have to make the choice to not only rejoice in the Lord, but to believe that the Lord's word is true and to believe that God can indeed do anything but fail. When you do that and you have an extraordinary talent or an extraordinary ability to do the, the, the supernatural, to do the extraordinary, at the end of your time and season of doing it, particularly in sports, there's a place that you land called the Hall of Fame. This particular passage of scripture is the beginning of what individuals call, what many theologians call the, the, the Hall of Fame of Faith in the Word. And the Hall of Fame of Faith is significant because each and every individual here, a lot like us today in the earth, come from different walks of life, come from different mindsets, come from different family backgrounds, come from different economic status, come from different places in life. Yet they all wound up in this same place. And you may say, well, Pastor, how'd that happen? I'm getting ready to tell you. It happened because they all tapped into a fundamental truth that God desires us to tap into today. That apart from him, we can do nothing. But more importantly, we have to believe what the word says, even when it doesn't line up with what we see. Let me say that again. We have to believe in what the word of God says even when it doesn't line up with what we see. Because faith, as the word lets us know, is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. You and I have the unique responsibility, and we have the unique promise that we'll never be left nor forsaken by Jesus Christ. And that means that we have to believe every single word that he said. Every word that he said about deliverance, every word that he said about healing, every word that he said about victory, every word that he said about everything concerning the word. And it starts with us believing the promise that he gave us, that he'd be with us always, even to the end of the age. We've got to understand that, that, that what God desires to do is he desires to move through you and I, and he desires to move through you and I right now. And he wants to move through you and I with a now faith. Now, you've heard people preach this time and again that now means right now in this instant, that that now means that that is, that is a statement in the text that's exegeted out. Now, after all the things that came before, faith is. Those things are correct, but what God desires us to look at today is the word now as an acronym. And the acronym is designed to help us see the, the heart of the text as it pertains to where God is taking us in this now faith series. The word lets us know and it wants us to know and, and it's reminding us that we need to strive to walk in faith, but not just any kind of faith, beloved. We've got to walk in a faith that's specific. We've got to walk in a now faith. And the now is an acronym. We've got to walk in a faith that's noteworthy. We've got to walk in a faith that's overt. And we've got to walk in a faith that's worship-driven. Amen. 
And that's how God desires us to walk in a now faith. He wants us to walk in a noteworthy, overt, worship-driven faith that truly draws people's attention. But most importantly, it draws God's attention so that God is glorified and he's pleased with what he sees. Let's look at the end in this right now. Noteworthy. It's a noteworthy faith. Look at what it says in verse 1. In verse 1, it says, now faith, and I'm in the Amplified, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see, and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. That's what we have to understand. When something is noteworthy, that means it bears keeping record of. It bears keeping a mental note of. It bears taking a look at, but more importantly, it bears filing. It, it bears filing and holding on to. It bears us remembering that. And this is what Paul was trying to help the Hebrews see and understand. The Hebrews understood the, the, the New Testament as it, as it pertained to Matthew and the gospel according to St. Matthew. They understood things by laws. They understood things by precepts. They understood things by history. They were very much into the logos dynamic. Like many of us today in the earth, beloved, many of us believe what we see, believe what we know, believe what we understand. But God is, ha, ha, wants us to tap into leaning not unto our own understanding, but instead acknowledging him in all of our ways. That's what makes faith noteworthy. That's what makes it a noteworthy proposition because we understand the value of it. Remember I read in the, in, in the definition in the first verse in the Amplified Bible that faith is like a, a, a title deed. It's like understanding that you have something. You have something that's of value. You have something that's noteworthy. You have something that people want. But oftentimes people don't realize the value of what it is that we have until we've lost it. And what God wants us to do today in the now faith proposition is to understand before we lose our opportunity that the faith that he's given us is valuable, that the promise that he's given us is true. It's not counterfeit like a counterfeit $20 bill. It's very, very real, and it's very, very true. Even if we don't physically see it right now, church, it's very true. And we've got to understand that because it's true, we can have a conviction in believing beyond a shadow of a doubt that I don't care what you tell me. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what my situation feels like. I know that my God not only shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, but I know that it's already done and I don't even see it. And that's the beauty and the blessing of understanding and knowing when something is noteworthy. When something is noteworthy, you believe it beyond a shadow of a doubt. That doesn't mean that doubt stops coming. But what it means is in the face of doubt, we continue to stand on the promise and know that as we stand on the promise, we understand and believe what God said as it pertains to promises, that all of his promises are yea and amen. Look at what it says here in Matthew 24. Verses 11 through 13. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This passage of scripture seems to paint a very bleak picture. And it's a picture that may look very similar to a picture that many of us might be living through. A time where it's tests, a time where it's trials, a time where it looks like that there's there's more uh, grief and situation and circumstance than way out. Let me break it down this way. Uh, a situation where there's more month than money. A situation where there's more circumstance than patience. A situation where there's more pain than, than grief and capacity to bear it. You know what I'm saying. But I, what I love here is what it says in verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. So what we do is as long as we make this thing noteworthy and as long as we understand that the key is not necessarily about winning, the key is enduring and believing God's promise because as we endure and believe God's promise, victory is certain because God can do all things but fail. Which brings us to our second point and that is that we've got to strive to have a faith on display that's overt, amen. When you go to Webster's Dictionary and look up the definition for the word overt, what you find is this. Something that's done or shown openly, plainly, or readily apparent, not secret or hidden, 
And the example that it gives is an overt act of aggression. And verse 2 lets us know that by faith, in the Amplified, trust and holy fervor, which was born of the same. The men of old had divine testimony born to them and obtained a good report. What that's saying is, is that they overtly did this thing. They believed God. They took God at his word. They decided to be extraordinary by doing the extraordinary. They decided to not be like everybody else by doing the atypical. What am I saying? I'm saying that in order for us to have something that we've never had, God is calling you and I to do something that we've never done. And it starts with our faith level. If we want to go to higher levels in God, we've got to go to deeper depths in ourselves and stand stronger and stronger on the faith that we have. The faith, it can be the size of a grain of a mustard seed, the word says. If we have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, we have the capacity to speak to mountains, the word declares, and tell them to be removed, to be cast into the sea, and it has to happen. What that means is that God is calling us to have a noteworthy and overt faith, a faith that's bold enough to stand in the face of trials, to stand in the face of tests, to stand on platforms where you where it's been decreed that you've been decried against, to stand in places where you were told you'd never stand, to stand in situations that you were told you're going to die in, to speak life in situations that people are written you off in. That's the kind of faith that God is calling us to stand in in this day, beloved. Is it a challenge? Absolutely, it's a challenge. And this is why writing this in this fashion, in this capacity, as a Hall of Fame introductory speech, if you will, was critical because it showed that this is something that not everybody attains. A lot of people start out on this journey, but not everybody attain it, attains it rather. Not everyone attains it because it takes much more than work. It takes much more than mental toughness. It takes a burning desire in your gut. It takes a burning desire in your heart. It takes a burning desire in your spirit to be able to stand in the face of the onslaught, to be able to stand against the tricks and the plans of the enemy, to be able to stand in pitfalls. And even when you make mistakes, to know that even in the midst of my mistakes, I am beloved of God. I am a child of the most high. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am a lender and not a borrower. I am the manifestation of the promises of God concerning and pertaining to my life. And it's difficult to confess those things when everything around you makes it look like and makes it seem like it's the exact opposite. But there's a term that go, that's going on right now uh, 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 with, from the left to the right as it pertains to the political divide and it's, ca and it's, and it's cancel culture. What the enemy wants to do is speak a cancel culture over our our lives. Speak a cancel culture over our health to get us to stop believing that by his stripes we are healed. Speak a cancel culture over our finances to make us believe that we're, that we're borrowers and not lenders, that we're beneath and not above. Speak a cancel culture as it pertains to our salvation, where it says that you sin, so there's no way that God can use you when the word says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But, but when the word says that, that he's met us in darkness and brought us from darkness into the marvelous light. The enemy tries to speak a cancel culture, but what God is calling you and I to do, beloved, is to cancel the cancel culture by speaking what thus saith the Lord. In spite of what it might look like, speak what thus saith the Lord. In spite of what's going on, speak what thus saith the Lord, because this is a formula that's been tested and it's been tried and it's been proven. It says right here in verse two, it says in verse two that, 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 that the men of old had divine testimony, born to them, and obtained a good report. Meaning individuals that came before you went through the trials and tests that you went through. The exact same trials and tests that you're going through right now, they went through in theory. They went through in tenet. They went through in foundation. And they found that the, that the risen Savior, the risen Lord, they found that the promises of God were true. They found that they could stand on the solid rock of God's word and know that standing on the solid rock of God's word, there is victory found. There is victory and there's breakthrough found. And that's what God is 
is calling you and I to do. He wants us to be overt with this. He wants us to not reinvent the wheel with this, but he wants us to, to, to grab onto that wheel and, 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 and lay our hand to that plow that's already rolling and take advantage of that momentum and let that momentum carry you to the next level and carry you from faith to faith and glory to, to glory to glory, to carry you from where you are to where God desires you to be. Because as you allow that momentum to carry you from where you are to where God desires you to be, that's when you see the full manifestation of God's glory and God's hand on your life on full display. Look at what it says in 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses 5 through 7, about the benefit of being an overt faith walker. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Like the recipe of a favorite dessert, it takes all the ingredients being at work and on full display in their portion to bring about the end result. And it works the same way here as it pertains to faith and as it pertains to what God's purpose is for our life and being overt faith walkers. If we took this passage of scripture and went on and extrapolated it out to, to verse 8 to see the finished product, what we would see here reads as follows. It says that, for, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that everything that we need, everything that we have, everything that he's calling us to do will not only make us a blessing to him, but a blessing to others and it leave us in a constant state of being full. Amen. God desires you and I to be full to overflowing so that he can use us to be a blessing to others. But the fullness only comes as we surrender ourselves to God and become more and more overt in our faith walk. We come, the more we become overt in our faith walk, the greater the glory that we're giving to God. And the greater the glory that we're giving to God, the higher levels of faith that God will open up to us because this is a, it, it's, it's a continuum of faith to faith and glory to glory. And God desires to get more and more glory as we're willing to walk deeper and deeper in our faith and walk further and further in our faith. And this is what the Hall of Fame is calling us to do, is giving us examples of individuals that truly sacrificed everything, that truly laid it all on the line, that truly left nothing in the tank, if you will, that truly gave it every fiber of their being every day of their life. It doesn't mean that they won every outing. It doesn't mean that they won every uh, uh, interaction that they were in contention with. But what it does mean is that they made up their mind to do like the last point, the W here. They made up their mind to make God worth everything. And that's the worship driven dynamic of faith. They made up their minds to strive to make their faith a worship driven faith, a faith that showed God, God, you're worth everything to me. Being in your presence and you knowing me by name is worth more than any recognition I could get here on the earth. You knowing me by name is worth more than any accolades I can get from anyone. You knowing me by, na by name, God, is worth more than any award I could get from any organization on this side of heaven. Because you knowing my name means that I have a place in glory. You knowing my name means I have a place in your presence. And this is what we all should strive for. Look at what it says here in verse 3. It says, as I read from the Amplified, by faith we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. I need you to understand they were fashioned, put in order and equipped for their intended purpose. We just came out of a series on purpose driven, li purpose driven living. And what happens here is when faith kicks in, in the midst of purpose driven living, what happens is that that faith pushes us to levels in our faith and pu pushes us to levels in our activity. That faith pushes us to dimensions in, in God so that only God is glorified. People don't even see us. 
All they see is God when we're doing the work. But eventually when we sit down somewhere, somebody goes back and tells a story. Some God body goes back and has a witness. Somebody goes back and has a testimony of what God did through you. And it's that testimony that blesses down through generations. Is that testimony that continues to live down through the ages? Is that testimony that serves as a perpetual and eternal living witness that God desires to write in and through you so that it lives on for all time. If you look in the natural hall of fame, the natural hall of fame, the one thing that every bust has in common is that it's made from the same material and it has the same base plaque on it. And the plaque has all the same basic information. It has the, the player's name. It has the player's years that they played. It has the player's statistics of what made them hall of fame players. It had the same basic information. So what happens is whether it's a pitcher or a catcher, whether it's an infield or an outfield, or whether it's a black man or a white man, whether it's a manager or a player, the one through line is that you see the components, you see the ingredients on full display that it took. You see the commitment, you see the dedication, you see the longevity, you see the sacrifice, and you see the end result of success. It works the same way with us as believers, beloved, and it all starts with two words. The two words it starts with are by faith. Because that's what worship-driven living is, is by faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Another way to put it, faith is taking God at his word and believing that God will, even when it doesn't look like God can. And once we believe that God will, even when it looks like God can, even when it doesn't look like God can, we come to realize and know and understand that God's word is better than any check that can be written on any bank account. No matter how secure it is, God's word is even more secure. The Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away before one jot or tittle of God's word comes back void. And this is what we've got to understand and realize in our living as we do worship driven, worship driven living by faith. By faith, we'll see signs, wonders, and miracles follow us. By faith, we'll see individuals healed as we lay hands on them that are sick. By faith, we'll tread on serpents and scorpions. By faith, we'll drink deadly things and they'll not harm us. Bringing it to real time. By faith, we'll see bills paid supernaturally. By faith, we'll be able to bless individuals when we're in need of blessing. By faith, we'll see souls come to Jesus even in the midst of our sadness and our tears because our witness, because we believe God and take him at his word, our witness is, is bringing forth worship even in the midst of our pain. This is how God desires us to live and this is how he desires us to walk and move by faith because when this life is over, and when we lie down and close our eyes and take our last breath and we'll call to glory, when we've gone through judgment and been found in right standing and we hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant, somebody on this side of glory is going to be telling your story. Somebody on this side of glory, still on this side, is going to be telling your testimony and speaking on your witness and talking about your commitment and talking about your dedication and talking about the formula for your success, which which was the, 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 the noteworthy living, the overt living and the worship driven living by faith. And they'll start a sentence about you by faith, brother, so-and-so by faith, sister, so-and-so by faith, pastor, so-and-so by faith, apostle, so-and-so by faith, whatever the title is, so-and-so did this or did that. That's where we want to live, and that's how we want to be remembered on both sides of eternity. We want to be experienced on the eternal side of eternity, and we want to be remembered on the natural side of eternity, so that on both sides, the glory continues. On both sides, our faith is recognized and rewarded, not for our glory, beloved, but for his glory. Look at what it says here in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your most reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we see here in the first two verses of Romans 12, the importance of living worship driven faith in the new king james version that verse reads this way and it is it, the perfect way for us to close out our message today i appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of god to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god which is your spiritual 
worship. God is appealing to us through this ver these th verses out of Hebrews. He's appealing to us to, to, to meet the conditions, to meet the criteria, to be found in this Hall of Fame. Because unlike the Hall of Fame, the, all the Hall of Fames here in the earth, Unlike the Hall of Fames of baseball and football and basketball and hockey and, and, and soccer, unlike those Hall of Fames where votes are needed to get in, unlike the journalistic Hall of Fame and the governmental Hall of Fame where it's not what you know, but it's who you know on the natural side as far as what you can do for them, we all have an end to the Hall of Fame just because of who knows us. Jesus died six hours one Friday for you and I. Jesus made the choice. To, to live a noteworthy life by uh, living a life in such a way so that he was tempted at every point, as the word says, like we were, but he sinned not. Live, Jesus lived a life that was overt, where he made it known countless times that he does nothing in the way of miracles apart from his father. Even to the point of, of praying the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went to his father, if there's any way this cup could pass from me, Lord, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. His ministry was worship driven because even in the midst of the pain and the agony of the cross, he still made a made a made a prayer to God to 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 forgive them for they know not what they do. To say that into thy hands I commit my spirit, meaning I'm making the investment not for myself, but I'm making the investment for 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 my brothers and my sisters. He made the investment for you and our church. He made the investment and now he's sitting at the right hand of the father with all power and glory in his hands, making the appeal to the father so that we can be recognized as sons and daughters of the most high God through our elder brother, Jesus Christ. So here in turn, he inspires Paul to write to the church of the, the Hebrews, the, the, to the Jews, the reality of the closing out of all that they've read. In other words, he's saying, here's the conclusion of the matter. I'm now appealing to you. I'm appealing to you to, to put down all the logic. I'm appealing to you to put down what you know or what you think you know and go back to who it is that knows you. Go back to the promises that I made you. Go back to everything that I said, even up to you tear this temple down in three days, I'll raise it back up. Every single thing that he said is true. Every single word that he uttered was true. So he's appealing here. Paul is appealing here as he wrote to the church at Rome. The same appeal that he's making to you and I today. The same appeal that I'm making to you today if you don't know Christ. I'm appealing to you by God's mercy to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Don't hold nothing back from him because he's got a place with your name on it in the hall of fame. He's got a plaque with your name on it in the Hall of Fame. He's got a mansion in glory with your name on it in the Hall of Fame. He's got a spot waiting for you. He just wants you to take your rightful place because it is a symbol and a sign of your spiritual worship. I appeal to you today, my brother, and my sister, that don't that does not know Christ. Take your rightful place. I appeal to you, my sister and my brother, that does know Christ, but may not be walking in the fullness of your faith. Walk in the fullness of your faith. Take a now approach to faith. Exercise now faith. Because now faith is noteworthy. Now faith is an overt faith. Now faith is worship-driven faith. Now faith is a faith that brings about eternal results. If you've not made that declaration to Jesus Christ, this is your day. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. Let's pray. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I come before you a sinner. I come before you a wretch undone. I come before you in need of salvation. Your word says, Father, that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in my heart that God you raised from the dead, that I shall be saved. I confess with my mouth right now that Jesus Christ, you indeed are Lord. And I believe in my heart right now that Father God, you indeed raised him from the dead. So by faith, I am saved. I'm no longer a slave to the old ways of thinking. I'm no longer a slave to the old ways I spoke. 
I'm no longer a slave to the old ways I used to act because I'm a new creature through Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for salvation. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for salvation. I declare and decree that I am saved. And I thank you, Lord, for doing it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to welcome you to the household of faith. And I want to praise God with you for making the best decision of your life, both here and in eternity. Please email us and let us know about your experience today. The email address will be coming up shortly. Until next time, this is Pastor Derek Thomas reminding you and encouraging you to walk in now faith because now faith brings about glorious eternal results in your life. God bless. Living Witness Ministries is a church on the move that's dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through the preached and taught word, community outreach, and practical ministry designed to save souls and change lives. You can sow into the ministry via our cash app at dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. That's dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. Sow your seed in the good ground of Living Witness Ministries today. And thank you for helping us reach the world with the life giving word. We pray that you were blessed by today's broadcast and would love to hear from you. If you have any prayer requests, praise reports, or would like to learn more about Living Witness Ministries, you can contact us by email at livingtowitness at gmail.com. That's the word living, the number two, witness at gmail.com. Or reach us by phone at area code 404-955-8846. Again, that's area code 404-955-8846. Until next time, we encourage you to continue to live your life as a living witness.